right. Well, welcome everybody. I am glad you're here for another session with Father Tom. I was mentioning to Father Tom that this topic seemed rather um, timely based on some political discussions that are going on, at least in the Rockland School Board um, and other places about uh, some kind of more extreme groups getting a grip on uh, in the name of Christianity. Um, so um, I think it'll be an interesting uh, look at the rise of nationalism in our country and in our uh, own community. So um, I wanna let you know that I will go ahead um, and mute everyone. Just a reminder when he's when he begins, and just a reminder that if you want to ask a question, that's not meaning we don't want you to ask questions. Okay, I don't want you to take it that way. It's more just so that we can have clearer sound, especially for those who are watching the recording. But if you want to ask a question, a real easy way to unmute yourself if you can't figure out the the icons on your screen um, is to press the space bar if you're on a computer or laptop and hold it. And while you're holding it, you will be um, unmuted and you can ask your question and then release it and you'll be muted again. So um, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming one of my favorite presenters, Father Tom Bonacci. Thank you, Dyson. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> Yes. I'm having a little bit of trouble with my voice, so I apologize for that. And a prayer for the Senate. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are always in need of grace and transformation. Help us to promote love and understanding. Let truth be our guide, justice our purpose, and love our goal, as we welcome everyone into the friendship of our communities. Let us find in you our unity as we journey together to the fullness of life. Help us to walk in the light of your wisdom as we seek to do good in the world. All this we ask of you, who each and every day show us a mother's love and a father's care, your spirit dwelling within us forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> well, this is a four-part series on coping with nationalism. And I'd like to spend a few moments on the four topics that we'll be concerned about after, uh, as these four weeks unfold. Today, we'll be looking at nationalism in particular. Next week, we'll look at one of the root causes of nationalism, which is dubbed the doctrine of discovery. On September the 20th, we'll look at the relationship between systemic racism and nationalism. And then on September the 27th, we'll look at some responses to how we might cope with nationalism and racism. So it's important for us to realize that the issues concerning racism and the issues concerning nationalism are usually wrapped up together and on top of one another. Now, let's say some things about what makes this series difficult. Nationalism sounds like a benign word. It sounds like the devotion that one would have to a nation. And technically, that's what we mean by patriotism. And so oftentimes, nationalists use patri patriotic language in order to mask, if you will, the nationalistic tendencies. Generally in sociology, politics, and theological studies, the word nationalism is negative and carries with it the sense of some kind of 
festering disease that sets into the mindset of a people. It is not to be confused with patriotism. Now remember, nationalists oftentimes use patriotic and religious language to masquerade, if you will, or hide behind the use of the term nationalism. Sometimes you will see people who may not know exactly what they're talking about say, well, I'm a nationalist and I'm proud of it. Where in the history of nationalism deals with a certain exclusivity. It believes that the people who dominate politically in a given territory have superior and divine rights over everyone else. And so there's a thin line between what we call nationalism and what we call racism. As a matter of fact, one of the ways to get racism to work is to construct nationalistic ways of thinking. Also have to be careful because in the current situation that we find ourselves in the United States, and this is true throughout the world, whenever a religious organization or a spiritual organization is concerned about the issues of nationalism, it can sound like we're dabbling into politics from a partisan point of view. And so it doesn't take too long for people who participate in this discussion to suddenly have a breakdown in the conflict. Obviously, if you talk about nationalism, it has political implications. So let's see where some of the confusion might be in the United States. You can see nationalistic tendencies in the current configuration of the Republican Party. Where you particularly see it is in the, the Freedom Caucus in the House of Representatives. And you also hear and see it in the rhetoric of the presidential candidates especially Donald Trump. Now, there is a, a distinction to be made between the political philosophy that someone might have as to how a country should be governed and nationalistic tendencies. But in the current situation, those areas are blurred. And so it's not my job or work to take a position in the politics, even though I don't think anybody would have a, to guess where I stand politically. It would be on the left end of the spectrum. But standing on the left or the right end of the spectrum politically is not the same thing as nationalism. You can be a leftist and be nationalistic. So right and wing politics does not necessarily determine whether or not you're dealing with nationalism. It just so happens that at the current time, nationalistic rhetoric is more heard on the side of people who may call themselves conservative or right wing. So I want to make a distinction between the politics, especially the partisan politics of the country, and the issues of nationalism. Now, without being judgmental or trying to be critical, I wonder sometimes if people use nationalistic language because it's convenient or expedient, but they actually don't know what they're doing. So you see it in what's happening in the courts recently. You see it with the Proud Boys, which would be a nationalistic organization. So courting the Proud Boys in order to be politically expedient opens up pathways that are extremely dangerous to a democracy or to the future and the stability of the country. Now some might say, 
Well, there's people on the right who are in minority groups, and that may be true. Skin color or race does not determine what political party you're in or whether or not you're a nationalist. So you can actually be a black man and be a nationalist. That may make no sense to some people, but if you look at the news and you encounter real people in the real world, you can see that skin color does not necessarily determine what your politics happen to be, or for that matter, what your politics ought to be, nor does it determine where nationalism is in terms of its reality. If you're following along with the notes, and I'm gonna do this a little bit with this series because it would help to keep the material under control. Let's look at pages two and three. Pages two and three of the notes is an essay that I wrote every week or so, or every two weeks, I write an essay on various topics that is published by the Christ the King Passionist Retreat House in Cypress Heights, or is published by the Interfaith Peace Project here in Antioch. And this was the reflection on nationalism. So it's an essay that I offer to you for your reflection. One of the ways nationalism comes across are certain elements that you might find in nationalism is that a nation is said that it has to be self-sufficient, nationalistic, protectionistic, it emphasizes individualism and isolation. And here's where you see it moves over into what might be conservative policies. You'll hear people say, we need to become independent of the rest of the world. We don't need the rest of the world. We don't do commerce with the rest of the world. We're too dependent on oil with the rest of the world. So we have to set up economic structures by which we find ourselves at home. So you find people saying things like, we need to bring the manufacturing back to the United States. The oddity of this is, Mr. Trump, ran on certain policies, oil production, bring manufacturing back to the United States, and a certain priority in the United States. If you look at Joe Biden's agenda, you see it matches the Trump agenda almost word for word. Oil production in the United States is at the highest it's ever been, and manufacturing is returning to the United States. And yet few people associate nationalism with Joe Biden. And that's because he believes in a dynamic relationship with the leaders of the world. So here's where you can see, you can have economic policies and political philosophies that are compatible but one tends to a nationalism and one doesn't. And that's why you almost have to be a surgeon to be able to do this work. By and large, a nationalist not only has a sense of isolation to the rest of the world, but has a certain sense of hostility to the rest of the world. But what compounds this is, what's rising in the United States at the moment and has been for the past several years is a phenomenon called Christian nationalism. So before today is over, we will look at several things. We will look at what constitutes nationalism and what constitutes Christian nationalism. But so far as sufficient to say you can have common policies to go across right or left on the political spectrum and it has nothing to do with nationalism. Nationalism has something to do with the way you think of yourself as a nation and a people 
and the way you think of the rest of the world. By and large, nationalists would restrict the right to vote. And that's because in nationalism, there's usually the tendency to believe that there is a superior race. And oddly enough, that race is usually European and white if you're talking about the Western world. If you go to other parts of the world, you may be confused as to why people have conflict one with the other when they seem to look alike. But that's because they can come from different areas of the world or different regions of the country. So you can see what happens when prejudice life experience, the hardships of life begin to have something to do with the self-definition. At the bottom of page three, we give you the agenda. In the course of this series, we will concern ourselves with nationalism, the doctrine of discovery, the con contribution to racism, so to speak. First, we want to make it clear the difference between nationalism and patriotism. Patriotism is love of country. Nationalism is cultural, territorial, political, and governmental purity that generally sees itself isolated from the rest of the world. And when it does relate to the rest of the world, and oftentimes relate to the rest of the world with a certain sense of hostility. The exception might be when nationalists meet nationalists. At the current time in the world, what that means is when a dictator or a would-be dictator in one part of the world meets another dictator, they usually have something in common. They have that isolationist philosophy. But it's almost contradictory. You see it today with Russia and North Korea. Russia and North Korea both have authoritarian regimes. They have no interest in each other. However, they seem to be developing a common enemy with Ukraine. So it's interesting that nationals, in one sense, will say, we need to be isolated from the rest of the world. We don't need anybody. But then when you see in the case of Mr. Putin, suddenly we need to build a relationship with North Korea in order to have weapons against the Ukraine. Notice now that the nationalistic tendencies in the House of Representatives in the United States it's going to jeopardize the future of American involvement in Ukraine, which is really odd because several years ago, the political party in question talked about the need to preserve democracy in the world. Now suddenly democracy is not important. What's important is, well, it's hard to say what's important. Here's where you see Trying to talk about a pure nationalism is absurd. Okay, let's go to some of the remedies to nationalism first before we look at the pathologies that are involved in nationalism in general and Christian nationalism in particular. Because as you're probably picking up here, not only are there political implications and social implications and economic implications, but there's psychological implications as well. As a matter of fact, people might become nationalists or become sympathetic to nationalists because of the life story and the life experience that they have. Look at page four, and I gave you a little bit of an outline here as to how we can cope with some of this material. Under the solution, which would be the top of the page, in dealing with other people, especially anybody you might suspect has nationalistic tendencies, you want to identify rather than label other people. 
So I use terms like nationalism. We use terms like liberal and conservative. So we can talk to each other about what's happening within the world, what's happening in the nation, what's happening within the family, what's happening within the church. But those labels are meant to be conveniences to our conversation. They are labels that might work very, very well on a blackboard, a PowerPoint presentation, but be very, very careful that you don't stick labels on other people. Because generally, when you meet other people, you meet an intersection of different motivations that may be mixed. So you might think somebody is a nationalist, but nationalists don't necessarily identify that way as nationalists. They may identify as patriotic. They may identify, for example, as saying, we need to get in control of the disorder that's in the world. So when you hear somebody say something, even if it's outrageous, before you react to them, you might want to question whether you should react at all. It's better to respond. And sometimes the way to get from reaction to response is, can I identify with what they're saying? Can I hear the passion that's in their voice? Number two, become aware of the historical circumstances. Right now in a state like Florida, you have a governor who ran for office against revisionist history, who now is doing revisionist history. You see it with slavery. We need to teach kids that slavery in the United States really had benefits to it. That's revisionism. Now, notice the motivation for this in Florida that was clearly stated is that we don't want our students to be upset about history. Now, notice the translation of that, if you look at it, is we don't want our white well-to-do kids to be upset. If it upsets minority groups, so to speak, that's perfectly okay. And so one of the things that nationalists will do is rewrite the history. Now, I don't know about you, but I spent some of my best hours sleeping in history class in high school. Something I regretted and tried to correct over the years. Now I find myself a student of history. The more we understand the history we come from, the more we understand the movements that are afoot within the country. So one of the greatest things you will do to combat the, the evil tendency, as I like to put it, maybe it's overstated, of nationalism is to become aware of the authentic history. And that usually means reading different sources and reading professional sources. Three. Become aware of the personal stories of other people. People usually take positions not because they did intense study. They take positions and do intense study because they're trying to cope with the pain and the anguish that's in their life. Especially when you're dealing with people who ordinarily are not caught up in the political world or the theological world, or the spiritual world, who may have very, very strong opinions. Generally, behind those opinions is a life story and a life history. So there are two histories to be aware of. The history of the nation, the history of the world, the history of the region. For example, if we were serious about the effects of nationalism in the United States, then you and I would do everything in our power to read about the indigenous people and their culture who were here before the Europeans arrived. What did this land look like? 
were the sacredness of the land. Many indigenous people are allowed. They've been incorporated into the society, but they remember something about the land in their corporate understanding. The more we understand the general history, the more we understand where we are. Second, to become aware of the history of another human being. Your dialogue partner is really critical. Because generally people have strong passions about what's going on in their life, not because they're theorizing about the movements in the world, but they're trying to cope with the pain and anguish that's in their heart. Fourth, even though you may deem somebody else to be a political enemy, or somebody may consider you to be a political enemy, we have to do everything in our power not to dehumanize the other person. So while I can strongly oppose the nationalistic tendency that are in certain political philosophies today, it is not worthwhile for me, nor is it productive, to demonize and dehumanize another person, no matter how mean or cruel they can be. Five, understanding where another person's coming from is not the same thing as agreeing with them, and it prevents us from being indifferent. Because you and I may seek to understand where somebody like Margie V. Taylor Green comes from, why she exerts such power in the House of Representatives. While she may be very easy to demonize and dehumanize because of the demonization and dehumanization that she does, it is not worthwhile for us to imitate that which we're trying to conquer. Gandhi said, you must become what you want the world to be. So we become aware of the history of the world, the history of the nation, the history of the region, the history of the people that we're dealing with. And we become aware of their biographies, so to speak. That's really critically important to understanding how we might speak and appreciate one another. It's also important for you to pay attention to your own history. For example, I'm from Southern European abstraction. Extraction. That meant that living in Western Pennsylvania, we did not become white people till 1960. If you worked in the mills of Western Pennsylvania as a laborer, you would never advance to management if you were Catholic or European, Southern European. You had to be Northern European and Protestant. That's in my life story. So I remember when my father was offered a job in management by United States Steel. And the local people said to him, the only way you're ever going to get that job is if you register Republican Presbyterian Church or a non-Catholic church. That's when I was a teenager. So these forces are at work and they can be at work very, very subtly within the country. They may be part of our life experience. Okay, let's pause for a moment. Any questions, any observations, anything you would like to share? Big problem here is we're talking about things that are in the political realm, and hopefully we're talking about them respectfully and surgically so that we can see the tendency to at work. Any thoughts, any feelings, any points of clarification so far? I, I would just say Nothing. that, that um, 
humanizing those who dehumanize others has got to be one of the greatest challenges. And I think that social media reinforces the silos that we're in because we're just, I'm just getting reinforcement of the things that I believe. And it just makes me angrier and angrier at other other people who don't, uh, whose philosophies I find abhorrent. And again, everything's even being distilled. You know what I mean? I, I wonder, maybe, and maybe that's your whole point um, to try to understand because you might find that, that things are more nuanced, but because of, of the way things are now, we, 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 everything gets drawn to the edges and, and even greater polarities. Um, it's just, uh, it's just very hard. It's just becoming increasingly hard. And yet at the same time, I think I, I, I just guess the, I sense that there's fear that underlies some of a lot of this nationalism and you, I just want to say you, you don't have to be so afraid it's going to be all it's going to be okay you know I want to just reassure them it's going to be okay and to your last point um you know my father was born Pasquale di Benedetto and then and in the 1950s he changed his name to Patrick Donald Bennett uh for business reasons and um uh, you know, he encountered those kinds of obstacles that you were oh. talking about. So that's part of my my family history as well. Thank you for that. There's two things that are really important. The social media has certainly changed the playing field today because of the power that it has, and it gives such power to individual people on the social networking. That's why uh, uh, several months ago, I gave a four-part series on the influence of media, that is the social media and the psyche of the way we talk about these things. And so social media, while it can be a great democratic tool in the sense of people speaking to one another, it can also be a tool that nationalists and terrorists and extremists love. As it can address itself to disgruntled people and it can create communities of the disgruntled. Now, when you bring disgruntled people together through media or any other way, there are two things that you can do. You can develop what we call a politic of resentment and retaliation, or you can move in the direction of justice and repair. Problem is, certain people who see this as an economic opportunity may not quite care about the damage they do and see this as an opportunity for advertising. And this is where the ethic comes in. The ethic in the social media is really critically important because if the providers are indifferent to the content, and only see it as an opportunity to make money, then they have no reason to direct the content. The other thing is, in the tradition of the United States, when you start talking about directing the content of communication, that sounds antithetical to anything the country stands for. And so where you see a lot of people with extreme nationalism constantly appeal to the First Amendment. I have the right to speak. That opens up an ethical question. Is your right to speak limited by your obligation to tell the truth? And of course, in the United States, the answer is no. Or you may not yell fire in a crowded auditorium. And the fact is, you can say things that are even injurious to the country on the social media under the guise of freedom. Somewhere we have to confront that. Ancient people would have been horrified by that. Ancient people would have never understood that the word feed of freedom ever meant that you had the right to do something evil. 
you had the right to tell a lie. It would be considered the very opposite of the virtue of truth. Okay, let's do a little bit more work. Let's go to the, the, the middle and the bottom of page four and see if we can specify and clarify more and more what we mean by nationalism in general. In the nationalistic way of thinking, humanity can be divided into distinct groups defined by religion, culture, and ethnic heritage. So if you have an understanding of the United States is melting pot, where we all come together, where we blend, so to speak. Today, some people use the imagery of the United States as a salad bowl, where we're all mixed together. This would be somewhat offensive to nationalistic thinking. Nationalistic thinking, distinct groups defined by religion, culture, and ethnic heritage. Now, you might think, well, that's fine. We can have an ethnic day. We can have a tie-in day in the parish. Or we can have an international food festival within the parish. There'll be a booth for all the distinct groups. We can even dress up in our distinctive costume and sing our distinctive music. What's wrong with that? Absolutely nothing. What's wrong with having distinct cultures, distinct languages, distinct ethnic and food and cultural understanding, no problem. The problem begins to come in with number two. Nationalists tend to think in terms of cultural purity, cultural and territorial purity. So yes, you have distinct groups, but the distinct groups are not necessarily equal do not necessarily should they enjoy the same rights. Number three, in point of fact, in nationalist thinking, multiple identities inside a nation are a threat to the purity, the safety, the security, and identity of a people. So you will hear oftentimes political people use nationalistic slogans and nationalistic way of thinking for political expediency or because they actually believe it. They're invading. They're coming to get us. They're climbing over the wall. They're coming under the fence. Life was really good till they moved in. I remember when this was a safe neighborhood then X moved in. Now, it never dawns on the nationalist that the neighborhood might not be safe because there's not sufficient police protection for minority groups. It is the rhetoric of nationalists to keep calling certain minority groups the criminals. If you remember in the last election, Mexicans, the dirty, they're racist, or they're, they're dirty, and they're rapist. They're coming to get you. They will destroy our way of life. So there's a we and a them. So the idea that you there are distinct national groups, so to speak, or distinct cultural groups, in the nationalistic mind does not mean one's equal. So if you stand up in front of a nationalist and say, well, we're all one people under God. What? what do you mean one people under God? And here's where it slides over into Christian nationalism in particular, or religious nationalism. In fact, did God make one group of people superior to the other? So that rhetoric, and you can see how it can, it can set right in very, very easily, by which whole groups of people are objectified as defective. Objectified as insufficiently human, as dirty, diabolical, untrustworthy, uncivilized. 
We'll see next week when we go to the Doctrine of Discovery that that's exactly what certain popes said about indigenous people. That when you met indigenous people, you did not meet somebody who was human. They had the potential to be human if they became Christian. So there are certain things that people like yourselves believe and who may think that that's what everybody else believes. And it's shocking when you meet people who don't believe that. And have heard this language in your family, and you might even have heard it in yourself. You may not have said it, but you may have thought it. I wish those people would go somewhere else. I did parish work for quite a few years. And one of the real crises in parish work was when the traditional identity of the parish shifted. When the parish used to be constituted by European people, there was a crisis when people from South America, Latin America, Asia, and Africa moved in. What are those people doing in my church? Now, as you can see, nationalism might be a matter of degree. Because we have certain nationalistic ways of thinking in our mind and hearts, doesn't necessarily mean that we're extremists. Fair-minded people might be able to identify with it and say, see, I need to do something about that. I think I'm becoming hateful. Am I buying the rhetoric? Am I drinking the Kool-Aid? Am I, remember, one of the things you do in terroristic and in the social media is you keep repeating something. So it's utterly illogical. It makes no sense. It's utterly unfair. But if you keep saying it over and over and over again, it suddenly becomes the norm from which you proceed. Number four, nationalism is not a development in any creative sense of the term. Nationalists don't evolve. They usually decay. In order to maintain the fear, to maintain the hatred, you have to dig in. That's why logic doesn't usually work. And speaking when it's somebody who has nationalistic tendencies, trying to reason with them may make no sense. Identifying with them does. So, for example, tell me more about your feeling. Tell me more about your thought. So that the person begins to self-see that there's a flaw here, that there's something wrong. It would be very, very worthwhile to study the recovery that nationalists and extremists go through. There are people out there who have recovered from nationalism and recovered from extremism. Their stories tell you something about how we might cope with this issue. Number five, instead of developing, nationalists fall back into clear and uncertain remembrances of history that never happened. It's kind of odd to put it that way, but it's very, very clear to them what happened. So if you look at Texas and Florida, writing elementary books for kids in the schools, part of the agenda is to take the word slavery out replace it with work camps for poor Africans to see it in terms of the St. Vincent de Paul Society and the Salvation Army or to go to moral equivalency. We had to get them under control because they rebelled against us. They rebelled against the social order. So you tell a history that never happened and you make it clear as a bell. And keep repeating it. Here's how awful this can be. Let 
when the textbooks in Florida began to reflect that somehow or another slavery had benefits. They interviewed a mother who was on the progressive end of the spectrum. This is what she said. Well, I disagree with it, but I would like my kids to learn both sides. Notice the fairness of the woman. She wants her children to learn both sides. So now notice what has happened. The institution of slavery can now be spoken about as two sides. On one side, was it an oppressive economic regime against Africans, or was it a relief program? See, her fair-mindedness calls it both sides. When something is a bold-faced lie based on racism, it is not a side. As a matter of fact, if you know anything about history, history doesn't divide into two sides. It involves, it, 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 it divides into multiple perspectives. Simply, nationalists remember what never was and long for it. You might even do it yourself. I hear it all the time. People will say this. When I was a kid, you could leave all the doors open and walk up and down the street with no trouble. And that was true. In my neighborhood, you could walk up and down the street with all the doors open. What you couldn't do was cross the street. You cross the street, you went into another turf. The neighborhood was divided into turf. And so different groups of people stayed on their turf. There were certain avenues and boulevards you could walk on together as long as you were apart in order to get somewhere. But when you defaulted back into the neighborhood, you then crossed the street. As it says in West Side Story, the play, keep to your own kind. So many of us can tell stories now where we might laugh, but it isn't funny. When I was a boy, one of my uncles, who was Italian, married an Irish woman. The family got together and had a meeting. What's wrong with him? Couldn't you marry your own kind? Stupid me says, I think she's Catholic. What's that got to do with it? Her family's from Ireland. And I said, what's that got to do with it? And they said, wait till you grow up and wake up and find out. I'm still trying to find that one out. So imagine what happened in certain parts of the United States when white people and black people fell in love with each other and wanted to get married. You could be put to death. The man, that is, if he's black. Number six, one pure race symbolizes and realizes the nation and the ideal citizen. Tolerance to others as long as they stay in their place. And so if you look at the rhetoric, look at Alabama, for example. Alabama has defied the Supreme Court at least twice when it comes to who has the right to vote. And the right to vote is clearly being determined along racial lines. As a matter of fact, nationalistic tendencies in the United States have declared that the hotbeds of iniquity are the urban centers of the United States. 
So the places that need to be put under control are the urban centers of the United States, which generally have majority minority populations. So, so underneath nationalism, if you scrape the surface, you can see the dynamics of racism. One race is pure and has the right to dominate and control others. As a matter of fact, if you remember, one of the relatives of Donald Trump at the last Republican convention for president got up and said, it should be one vote per family, not one vote per person. And the person who would determine the vote of the family would be the father, the husband, or the oldest brother. He would consult with the family, but one person would have the right to vote, the male, the, the white male. And see how we might argue about this politically. Behind it is something else at work. Black women have long identified that not only is there an issue of racism in the nationalistic tendencies, but there's sexism as well. That's why you hear people say things like intersectionality, critical race theory. They're trying to impose an ideology. Well, Intersectional thinking means no one issue is out there all by itself. For example, if you own a home or you rent a house and you ever try to do some repairs, you immediately get in touch with intersectionality. You call the garage repair person. They come and say, well, they don't make that motor anymore. Of course they don't. Well, I can put a new one in. Well, of course you can, but I can't put into the system you have because your electricity is out of date. So we'll have to change. Oh my God, you have a fuse box. Well, can we change the fuse? But remember, that all you want to do is fix your garage door and now you have to rewire the house. Then you discover you have appliances that don't operate with the new system. There's the intersectionality. Two things that seemingly have no relationship to one another, the garage door and the refrigerator, are suddenly incompatible because you had to upgrade the electrical system in the house. Sexism, racism, and nationalism cross over one another. Number seven. Nationalism is a form of race making. As such, discrimination is made possible and preferable. It would be good if those people, whoever those people happen to be, were in their place. Before we take a break, let's pause for a moment and do a little summary work. Nationalism fulfills certain social and psychological needs concerning identity, meaning and purpose, security and well-being. That's why people who have ever been the object of violence or the object of scorn can very, very well become influenced by nationalistic thinking or exclusionary thinking. In the real world, these things are dynamic in the matter of degree. Rarely do you meet someone with a nationalistic tendency who's an extremist. 
It may be a person who was mugged. It may be a person who lost a job. It may be a person who was skilled in an industry that is no longer dominant within the United States. Notice sometimes that when there's a technological change afoot, for example, shall the future of America be electric cars or fossil fuel automobiles? Notice the rhetoric of certain politicians. They're against the coal industry and the oil industry because they don't want you to have a car. There's another degree of the intersectionality, ecology, and the future of the earth. It'll be very, very interesting to see because come October 4th, a new encyclical by Pope Francis will be published, The Other Dimensions of La Data Si. This Pope then will have published two encyclicals on the care of our common home. If you look at La Data Si, the first one, you'll see it has an awful lot to say about economics, politics, racism, and indigenous people. That's why among many conservative people within the United States, including Catholics, the encyclical is outright rejected. And there's that intersectionality again. To somehow not if you go along with this ecology stuff, you're going to destroy the traditional industries. There's always something that's being destroyed. Always something that's being taken away. Nationalists live with a certain sense of panic, that somebody's out to get me. Notice in the political speech, that's exactly what one politician said. They're not out to get me, they're out to get you. And I'm standing between you and them. That's the rhetoric of the nationalists. That's why even a dictatorship can seem to be beneficial because it gives a sense of security and restores the sense of identity. When Pope Benedict was informed that there was a great number of people leaving the church, actually there's a great number of people leaving organized religion, Benedict responded by saying this, will be smaller, and more faithful. The idea being that those people go, or we get rid of them, we'll get rid of the problem. I don't believe Benedict was a nationalist, an extremist, or a terrorist. My point is, is how easily this language comes into our mind, heart, and soul, and how easily we speak this way. I've even caught myself saying the country would be better off if the people I'm referring to went to another country. How about the moon? Neptune would be a good place for them to go. The dark side of the moon, that's nationalistic thinking of a type. So my point is not to come up with a boogeyman or a monster out there that you have to go assassinate as your enemy, but to understand how easily this rhetoric can set in how easily we can have this sense of superiority. Did you ever hear anybody say this? I believe to the, I belong to the true church. All the other churches are false. They all separated from us. We are the greatest and the best. Someday they'll return to mama. Some people would say, well, that's ecumenism. Other people would say that's insulting. You need to know the history. You need to know the history of what's going on in the world, what's going on in the neighborhood, what's going on in yourself, and what's going on in the other. Okay, let's take a little break. We'll come back, entertain your questions, and conclude with some insights into Christian nationalism. 
And I can stay right here if you want to talk a little bit. Do I should take a, what, a five-minute break? Or? Yeah, I think five minutes is good. So um, those of you live 205 will return. Very good. Good stuff. Make any sense? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and of course, it is always sort of an eye opener when you realize, yikes, we don't want to become what we hate, right? Or despise and someone else, you know. Yep. I think it is good to do, um, I, I like the approach of just what is nationalism and then what happens when it becomes, what does it look like as Christian nationalism? It's a good, good way to do it. It's a tough subject to get into because it, it has so much political yeah. It just so happens that the present time on the right wing political spectrum is where the nationalistic language is. Right. Yeah. And the fact that Pope Francis has spoken about it really has, for people on the right, really... Um, well, I mean, they've made it's made his comments less valuable, that's not the right word I'm looking for, but um, there's a tendency to be more dismissive of Pope France as well, you know. Um, I, I did have somebody say to me not long ago, well, you know, I don't really care for Pope Francis, he's too liberal, and I said, in what way? And they really couldn't tell me. But I think it's, um, it's what is, you know, because there was nothing specific that they were concerned about that he was saying. And and I think it, it's just uh, this idea that he has spoken out against maybe some things that they hold to be very valuable. You know, the idea of... Uh, anything that doubles around, with, anything that opens the door. Mm -hmm. It's like in the United States, for example, you have, well, not been in the world, you had clubs where Jews were not welcome, mm -hmm. where minority groups were not welcome. Something would go wrong if those people came in. Mm -hmm. So the rhetoric of Francis from the very beginning has been all are welcome. Right. Mm -hmm. Also, he he dialogues with people that we traditionally disagree with. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe when you were a kid, a parent said to you, avoid those people. They're different than us. They're wrong. You'll lose your faith if you hang around them. So that rhetoric, of course, is in our DNA as kids. Mm -hmm. There's certain places you don't go. There's certain people you don't meet. There's certain things you don't do. How when you see the number one person who's supposed to, to maintain the tradition violate the code? Oh, that's a good way to say it. It becomes suspicious. Yeah. yeah. Well, and as well, he knows. People, you know, there's people who love John Paul II. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the last of the popes. <laughs> and I remember I, I showed some people a slide, not, not out of cynicism, but I said, you know, nobody has done more work in the contemporary church in the field of interfaith spirituality than John Paul II. 
And there was a, a slide of him, a photograph, that he picks up the Quran and kisses it. Hmm. And the immediate response of the people I was with was with the fake photograph. Oh. Even though it was an official photograph from the Vatican, it was the fake Vatican. So you have to maintain the clarity. You have to maintain that the Pope, the traditional Pope, maintains the traditional order as they understand it. Therefore, if you have evidence to the contrary, the evidence is false. Mm. Wow. They talk about defending the truth. Mm -hmm. What story does it tell? It, it tells that I can't lose my security. Hmm. Some point, life will catch up with you. <laughs> when you actually meet the people that you say you don't agree with, right? And actually like them. <laughs> Okay, I think we're good. I think everybody is pretty much back. Does anybody at this point have questions for Father Tom on anything or an observation, an aha moment? Anything you'd like to share? I can take you to page five. So we tried to look at some of the motivations for nationalism. We tried to be sensitive to nationalistic tendencies in the United States as they're politically configured. At the present time, nationalist language finds itself in the right wing of the country. It could very well find itself in the left wing of the country. But right now, it's in right-wing rhetoric. Whether it's intentional or not, it's there. Then we wanted to do some sharper thinking about what constitutes nationalism. And perhaps what's really, really important in nationalistic thinking is the belief in the superiority of one race or one group of people over another. And you could actually have people of a minority race who believe that people of the majority race are the superior. So you will find women, for example, who will say, I've read the Bible and the Bible said I should be obedient to my husband, so I am. Whatever he says goes. It gives a sense of hierarchy. It gives a sense of security. It gives a sense of identity. I know my place. That's why you'll notice in the nationalistic thinking in the United States, there's a great simplification of issues like abortion. The abortion laws are so severe in some states that women have no treatment for miscarriages. Inability to talk about something from multiple sides where everything is, you're, you're pro-life or you're pro-death. Once you get into that either or thinking, you're usually in some degrees of insanity rather than in some degrees of openness. What it is politically, what it is morally, what it is medically can be very, very different things come under that word abortion. It is so difficult that even if somebody like myself would do to make distinctions in it, you can get yourself in very, very serious trouble. Again, because I can understand multiple points of view and appreciate them doesn't mean I agree with them anymore. It means I disagree with them. 
It means we have the intelligence to look at an issue from multiple sides. Compounding this issue in the United States is the rise of something called Christian nationalism. And I must give fair warning to Catholics. The word Christian here does not mean you. In large sectors of the United States, the word Christian does not mean Catholic. As a matter of fact, when I lived in North Carolina and ministered in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Kentucky, and I would go to places that were doing ecumenical sensitivity, you would see Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, Catholicism. And I would say, Catholicism is under Christianity. No, it's not, Father. Catholics don't believe in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. It's a papist religion of paganism. So Christian nationalism does not use traditional rhetoric of the Catholic Church. Although when I was in grade school, we studied something called Christian social living because it was important for European Catholics in general and Southern European Catholics in particular to prove they could be patriotic, not nationalistic. Now let's look at some of the features of Christian nationalism, page five. Christian nationalists believe that America is defined by Christianity. So you hear politics, this is a Christian country. I'll show you some prayers next week up out of the sacramentary that seem to be nationalistic prayers. Of course, what kind of Christianity is crucial? When you say the United States is a Christian country, what Christianity are you talking about? Two, the government should favor this Christianity over other religions and over other Christians who may want to compromise. So several people pointed out, you know that ecumenical work you do, Tom? Yep. You know that interfaith work you do? Yep. It's because you hate America. Because if you loved America, you would be teaching people the superiority of the country over everybody else, that we were favored by God. There's this idea that God gave the land to us. To the people who discovered the land, God gave them the land. Of course, they used the Bible that God gives certain groups of people the land over other people. Three, America was and is a Christian nation, willed and established by God. Now, whether it was nationalistically intended, it had great nationalistic effect. In the 50s, we modified and developed the motto, One Nation Under God. And that was put on the currency. Under God was added in the 50s. Is that a patriotic understanding or a nationalistic understanding? Notice how easy it gives way to nationalism in general, one special group, and Christian nationalism in particular, when the word God is synonymous with the God of the Christian community. Four. Our freedom will be lost if we do not honor and adhere to the Christian identity by which America was blessed by God. So your freedom, your dignity, is directly tied 
to the Christian independence of the United States. And so once again, you see in the revisionist history that the founding fathers, no mothers, the founding fathers were Christian when the majority of them were deist. But that would be going back to the history. And you can see why it's always important to rewrite the history. Somebody once said, the history is written by the one who won. The country will be blessed in direct proportion to its belief in God. And so you hear certain politicians today talk about that continuously. The latest one is people like Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, who want to restore masculinity. That one of the difficulties that corroded the United States was equal rights for women. That's why if you look at constitutionalist or originalist, nothing in the original constitution gave the right to vote to women. Women had citizenship because of their fathers, their brothers, their husbands. That's in the Bible. Read First Timothy. Number five, God blesses America. Now notice how it's very common for politicians at the end of their speech to say, God bless America. What's wrong with that, Tom? Nothing. There's nothing wrong with God bless America. But you would think that if you want world peace, you would say, God bless the world. Or at least God bless the United States, Canada, and Mexico since we're neighbors. But you can see how God blessed America can be simply patriotic or oddly nationalistic. God bless America and not the rest of them. In the war in Iraq, one of the soldiers spray painted the bomb and said, from Jesus to Allah on the bomb. Here's where you see that even the acts of war can become nationalistic. God blesses America and Christians have a duty and a right to ensure the Christian nature of America. So this idea of melting pot, this idea that we all come together, this idea of freedom of religion, hmm. Notice how freedom of religion for the nationalists can be very, very dangerous. It's freedom to practice your Christian religion. Remember back on 9-11, September the 11th, 2001. Suddenly diverse worship sites like mosques were objects of attack and were being dubbed by many people that's where they go to plot against us. If we look at the latest surveys across the United States, we see the high incidence of attacks on Jews. In Charlottesville, Jews will not dominate. What's wrong with a Jew? They're not Christian. Number six, Christian nationalists may not self-identify as such. The fusion of government, politics, and Christianity is self-evident in their experience and belief. Christian nationalism is a political ideology seeking to ensure the Christian religious identity of the nation. I have a classmate. This is way back when who got very, very angry because there was a decision made 
that the nativity scene could not be established on public property, such as the city hall. That there would need to be an inner faith display rather than simply something that favored Christian tradition. He yelled and screamed and yelled and was deeply offended by this. And he said, there's an attack on Jesus in the United States. Because everybody knows to be American is to be Christian. And while there may be Hindus running around and Jews running around and Buddhists running around, they're more like background than an essential part of the nation. There's a perceived threat that what nationalists believe with the dominant force in the country is fading. Seven is interesting. Violence in the face of compromising their religious freedom may be necessary. You now see the rhetoric of violence in the United States. That to restore this order may require that we respond with violence. And certainly that's what's going on with the Proud Boys that you read about so much in the news and the court cases at the present time. Nationalists believe that the rights of other people are secondary to the religious freedom of Christians. You can say the Supreme Court now has an established history of ruling in favor of religion in general and Christians in particular. A theory is that the doctrine of discovery is one of the major influences on this ways of thinking that goes back to the 15th century and the discovery of these lands the so-called discovery. And that we'll explore in greater detail next week. So we have a few moments right now. It would be very, very worthwhile if we engaged a little bit in some discussion. Any questions, any thoughts, any feelings? Don't forget, you can unmute yourself by just pressing the space bar. What's stirring out there? Oh, Father, um, it's Mary. When I, can you hear me? Yeah. Here. Well, when you brought up the, I, the abortion situation, I remember thinking when the Roe v. Wade was overturned <clears throat> that it, it bothered me so much that women were crying all over the when they were pictured protesting out. And I felt it too. I felt like it was an authoritarian hit against women. I think when you start pulling rights away, there are there's something the matter. I, I could not have an abortion myself, even if I were raped. I could not have it. But but I can't speak for everybody else. And I, I think there's something a lot. There's something else there. It's not just. Yes, yes. Yeah. This happens a lot in political rhetoric, and it certainly happens a lot in nationalistic rhetoric. It's that you oversimplify an issue. Mm -hmm. And then you make it black and white, and then you make it good and bad. Right. Yeah. And so anybody that comes along and makes any distinction is a communist sympathizer who hates America. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about or socialist or whatever. Yes, Renee. Sorry. Um, just thinking about how much I value Catholic um, ethical positions and um, positions of faith that refuse to take a partisan position, right? And and yet I feel like very often, 
even in parishes like the one I'm in now that I, you know, truly feel um, does wonderful things, that we still, we take this neut neutral position in order to avoid getting involved at all. It's almost like the fear of politics has taken away our ability to say, this isn't partisan, this is a, an interest of faith, and I won't be polarized to go either left or right, but I also won't be silent. Part of the problem is we would have to study how religion functions in the United States. Religion in the United States traditionally has certain elements in it that really influence what you're bringing up today. First of all, religion was seen as private. Now, neoliberal Protestants in the 1800s confronting industrialization confronted the idea of personal, of um, individualistic religion and private religion by developing something called the social gospel. And you see the social gospel which manifested itself in groups like the Salvation Army, where you preach the gospel, but you preach the gospel in direct proportion given relief to the hungry and shelter to those who are homeless. And this goes back into the 16 and 17 and hundreds where Quaker women, Puritan women, Congregationalist women soften their churches by developing these outreaches. But the, those kind of movements have long been held in suspicion. For example, you would think that in light of Catholic ethics, that the dominant group inside any Catholic church would be the St. Vincent de Paul Society. The year A that we now have, where we read Matthew, on the Feast of Christ the King will read, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. You would think that in light of the traditional Catholic teachings, as a matter of fact, all you need to do is look at the religious orders in the United States that were responsible for health care, education, shelter, and relief. Nine times out of ten came from women. So there you see the, that was a, a direct affront that was charity. As long as it was charity, it was fine. Ronald Reagan famously said, the function of caring for the poor is not in the government. It's in the charitable organizations of the churches. That's why many orders of women look back over their charism and tradition and discerned they weren't simply charitable outreaches, they were justice outreaches. And that conflict is what we're in right now. So if you believe that the primary function of religion is personal, individual, and private, then if you have movements in the country that are social and public and political, you can see what a rub is. And we're caught up in that right now. That those, those are the great rivers that are shifting right now. That's why we, we can't get overwhelmed because we're really causing the consequence of privatized religion to go away. Now notice, even on the right end of the spectrum, religion is no longer private. It's in the public sphere. It's in the political sphere. The, the problem is, is that the right had no trouble appealing to religion, but the left did. If you look at it just now from the political point of view, left people still apologize. Well, I'm not being political. I'm being ethical. We're in the right wing, so we're being political. And we mean to win. So that, that that's another force that's really at work. So that, that has, the other thing is for the Catholic, 
for Catholics to say anything that's critical in the public sphere traditionally meant they weren't good citizens. Remember, up to the 60s, John Kennedy running for president, the number one accusation against Kennedy was, if you elect a Catholic, the Pope will be the president of the United States. And that prejudice is in our DNA. Mm -hmm. So Catholics have had a long history of having to prove that you can be a faithful Catholic and a good citizen that wasn't concluded. The language that we used was papist, that is people who follow the Pope it was a slur, will do what Rome tells them to do, not what America needs. That's really interesting in light of Pope Francis's care for creation and Laudato Si and the politicization of climate change uh, and that sort of thing that, um, you know, that that's something that uh, is associated with progressive politics. And um, it's, just, it's just interesting that, that uh, you know, we know that some of that is rejected um, on the conservative side. And what's interesting about that is that if you look at anything ecological, if you really want to see the effects of anything like climate change or industrialization, you would need to talk to people who hunt or live in rural communities anybody who's close to the land. Those would be your upfront witnesses as to what's happening in the ecological world that affects their finances, their well-being, and their way of life. So it's interesting that from a political point of view, the ecological issue seems to be a left-wing progressive idea that right-wing people oppose until you meet people who may traditionally be associated with right wing, but fish in the river, hunt in the forest, and can see the devastating effects in their livelihood, especially those who fish. Mm -hmm. So this is where, if you and I can break out of the either or, the polarization, and meet people. Remember, the, the dictum here is, we need to meet the people we love to talk about. We need to meet the people we love to hate. We need to meet the people we love to fear. And we especially need to meet the people we stereotype. And that, my dear friends, may even mean you have to meet yourself. Because you may call yourself names, put yourself down, so you can never meet you and never get in touch with your story. And it's funny, the things that you think should where we could find common ground it's so hard you know president biden went to florida to see the devastation after the hurricane and and governor DeSantis wouldn't wouldn't appear with him be, you know for political reasons when really the concern for the people there and everything should be what was uniting them that's right you're always going to find and political shenanigans goes on all over the place now, what's interesting, did you see McConnell? Remember, McConnell's had two moments where he freezes and he yeah. can't talk. And so Joe Biden called him to see how he's doing. Well, the media went nuts. They would say, what do you care about? And, and, and Biden said, well, McConnell and I are friends, and I care about him. I wanted to know how he was. But you're opposite on the political spectrum. So, so we have two different points of view, therefore you must die. And that's why I think it breaks. I think it breaks. Well, I think, let me put it this way, it's what has the potential to break. Whether or not those kind of examples 
work with nationalist extremists? I don't know, because national extremists would then say, there's something wrong with McConnell. You're not extremist enough. You're not nationalist. And see, there's a certain irrationality in it. Mm -hmm. There's a certain insanity in it. And that's why you can't give it legitimacy by calling it a point of view. Hmm. Next week, we'll look at where did this come from for us immediately? Why are we at this intersection at this particular period of time? What went on before the country even began to be at this intersection? Now, if I may, I know I'm a little bit over time, so I apologize for that. But it seems in the research that I've been able to do that the founding fathers and mothers in establishing the country established it with a sense that it would be dynamic. In other words, as we went along, rights would be added, identified, and expanded not preserved and contracted. Mm -hmm. And that's where the argument is. The argument is whether or not the American experience is a dynamic experience or whether it was codified in 1776 and that's where it stays. What went on before that to create this tension that's right in our face today. That'll be our work next week. Great being with you today. Love you, thank be at peace. Darcy, thank you for all your work. Absolutely, thank you for all your preparation and work with these great handouts and all of that. So we will see you next week at the same time. I will be sending a new link um, and new handouts. So. Um, look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, Father. Thank you.